goes on forever at your mercy till the sky. So why would I assume you'd be somebody that you're not sun in the morning? I know you're gonna be there every day.
7 says this. Starting in verse 4. Then he said to me, drop the side of these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together. Bone to bone. Down in verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain. Let that day live. 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 Drive on to the word of the Lord. He said, live.
And I believe he's not done. He's got something for the church. But he's calling us to be warriors. We have to stand up. He's calling for an army. We got to be in our word. We got to be praying. We got to be worshiping. He has got, and then like it says in the Bible, in the last days he will pour out his spirit. Young and old will prophesy. Miracles will take place. He, but we have to stand up and do our part. So we're going to have the prayer people come up here. And if you have a need, it doesn't matter what it is. If you need healing of mind, body, soul, um, relationship issues, finances, God is a big, he is going to do great mighty things. He has some miracles he wants to do. And we need the prayer people up here, but I also want you worshiping army people to come behind them. Because we are God's army, and we're coming united, and we need to give a black eye to that devil and know that he is not winning, and he will not win. So we need to come on up here and, and really think of these words that you're singing.
Lord, help us to uh, be able to see beyond what our eyes can see sometimes. And sometimes the disappointments of this world can bring us down, but God, if we're wise, we'll open up our eyes and, and see the evidence of, of the goodness of our God that is all around us on every side. Oh, 
All over my life, all over my life. 
We don't have to go past that for a second. I know for many of you, maybe you'll listen online in the future. Maybe you're looking at the world. I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe you're looking at a loved one, a family member, maybe a job situation. You really needed that word that God really is the great I am. And I know all the great Hebrew names people like to talk about with God, but when he said his name, he said, I am who I am. You can just sit for a second. Just to feel free to give the Lord what's going on in your life, your needs, your desires, your fears, your concerns, your anxieties. It doesn't always have to be rocking out and loud music and singing lyrics. It's okay to just connect with God right now, just you and him. somebody to hold your hand to get to the place. We've already walked through the outer courts. We've already walked past the distractions of this world, I hope. The worship team's already led us into focusing on Jesus. Let's just for a moment just keep our attention on him, not those around us, not on the music, but just on the great I am, the one we love. Maybe you don't know Jesus and you're just like, this is a moment that's boring. Just endure with us for a moment because for those of us who know Jesus, just nothing like being with him. that you would let us have compassion. People would crucify you, Jesus, one day, and you had compassion. And those who hated you, Lord, you walked around and you saw hurt, and you had compassion. I ask that we would have the same compassion that you have. Lord, as this morning's service won't just be about another list of procedures we go through, but Lord, this morning we would just take this moment, this holy moment, this moment you set aside for the creation of the world, knowing we were going to come here today 
and that this encounter with you wouldn't be seen as a smaller, lesser part of service. We realize the greatest part of service is when we're just opening our hearts to you. There's no greater ministry that can happen, no teaching that's that important, no worship song that well written. The greatest thing is just hearing what's on your heart. Lord, I thank you for the prophetic words you've already spoke through, Serena. But Lord, I believe that there are things you're speaking even here and now. Maybe not for everybody. Maybe people don't need to share it out loud, but you're speaking to us. You put the words, the sermon series on Pastor Jeff's heart that to seek your spirit. So Lord, we're just slowing down and asking your spirit right now to continue to speak to us. I realize I'm not praying here. I'm just talking to you guys and I'm just going to pass you through a moment here. I realize how hard it is to sit, but can we just 30 seconds longer? That's going to feel like an eternity, but can you just ask God to speak to you? Not for everybody, but can you just open your hearts and minds to God and let him speak to you? It's not weird. It's not hard. We're just going to ask God. Speak to me, Lord. That's 45 seconds. We can linger here longer, but we're not. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you a question. Why is it, and I'm going to show you a video clip here in a second during the offering time. I want to ask you, why is it hundreds, if not thousands of teenagers this weekend press so tight into an altar to worship Jesus? So tight in the altar that I went to go pray with one kid who I wanted to pray with, but I couldn't even get through the aisle because they're packed in the aisleways because you couldn't get to the altar. So loud that with earbuds in there, you still felt like you were uh, having atoms vibrated out of your body's existence. Yet they pressed in. And you're already, here it is. I guess we're going right to it. Why is this happening? That's not cool, right? That's not cool. So to... Pastor Jeff's got a great word. I'm going to skip some of the stuff I have. We have a few things going. You can sit down. You don't have to stay up here. Thank you, worship team. Don't You can hold applause, though. I don't want to lose the moment. I had some things I wanted to share for the offering, but I'm going to skip it because of time's sake. But I want to encourage you. We're going to get to the altar call at the end. Pastor Jeff, I know, wants to allow the Holy Spirit to move. I want to ask you, while you're listening, what is it that makes it people want to come down here to worship? Why is it somebody is willing to say, I want to sprint to the front when they say, who wants to say yes to Jesus? And you have kids who've never given their hearts to Jesus running up to say, I want Jesus in my life. Why is it when they say, who's willing to go all in, even though it's impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit, to come up during an altar call and say, God, I'm willing to make a difference in my world. And they race to the front knowing other people are, who were there who just came because it was a fun event are going to look at them and they're like, I don't care. I need more of Jesus. I need more of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you when we get to the altar call today, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that's missing and that when Pastor Jeff gives, however you're giving it, Pastor Jeff, I don't know exactly how you're landing the plane, but I know you said you wanted to have room for the Holy Spirit. So you're going to have a chance again to, today. And I'm I'm kind of primed the pump because I feel like that's what the Holy Spirit was doing. So I'm just priming it for you. What is it going to take for you to want to be all in with Jesus this morning? It's just all I have. So giving, I'm not going to share. Roberta, you got the only person who got to hear what my giving talk was. So you're special. If you who don't know, she's one of the most incredible people. Great lady. But So if you want to give, I'm not going to do a whole spiel. Sorry if you're like, hey, what's, tell me why I'm giving. Just faithfully responding to Jesus. So if you want to give, there's three ways. You can give physically, offering envelopes are in front of you. If you want to give digitally, 
You can text Sunrise to 833-345-5945 or you can hit the donate tab. If you're a guest, I do want to say welcome. This is not, we don't script everything. So if you're like, oh man, you're just scripting an emotion. No, we're not. It's not scripted. Pastor Jeff, I can show you my text messages. He's like, hey, I just know I want time at the end for the Holy Spirit. So let's just kind of do this, this, and and then uh, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for allowing the Holy Spirit to move at a different time slot than what you were thinking. But God moves when he moves. And we believe God's moving. So if you're here, we're glad you're here. There's a welcome card. Can it know your card sitting in the pew in front of you? Can just take a minute to fill it out. We want to say thanks for being here. Share a little bit about who we are. Hear a little bit about who you are. And then there's a spot for prayer. We'd love to pray for you. It's kept completely confidential, so you don't have to worry about it being thrown out to all the social media channels. But thank you for being here worshiping. We believe that things are going to be happening and have already been happening. And with that, I'm not going to compete with Buddy Barrel here because he's a lot more shiny than me. But I do have the cool badge. He doesn't have the VIP badge. So I figured I'd rock that out so I at least could compete with him. Like, yo, where are you at? I'm VIP. So, hey, we are at youth convention, you guys. You have no idea. Like, I'm in here, like, worship, and I'm like, I can hear. Like, I can hear myself breathing. I'm like... I actually can move. I didn't have, like, teenagers running by. I mean, it was the most incredible time. Like, I wish I could share all these testimonies, but I think that speaks for itself. You guys think this world's falling apart, yet that speaks for itself because it only takes a few people. It took 12 disciples. There's hundreds that were there. This world's not falling apart. Our country might be falling apart, but the gospel doesn't fall apart. The church is not falling apart. And you're going to hear how it's not just about America, but what we're doing around the world. So with that, can you give a warm welcome to Michelle Crash? She shares about BGMC. Thanks, Pastor Brian. Good morning. So Pastor threw us off last week when um, we didn't have communion, right? <laughs> just a little. And um, I don't mean to throw you off this week, but I'm going to share. I have the honor and privilege of talking about Senior Buddy or Senior Omegle. Um, Buddy Barrel happened. Buddy and I go back a long way. We won't we won't mention how far, but we go back a long way. It actually goes back to 1949. So he's been around for quite a while. I'm not that old. But Buddy is the logo for BGMC. And you ask, what is BGMC? I'm glad you asked. It stands for Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. Because what they do is we raise the funds, or the children are challenged to raise funds to support those missionaries out in the field. So this is, this is a little blurb about BGMC. BGMC stands for, again, Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. Kids are challenged to help our missionaries, challenged to sacrificially give to missions, challenged to help the needy in the world, challenged to pray for missionaries, challenged to pray for various groups of people, challenged to love and accept people of all races, challenged to reach the lost, and then challenged to keep their hearts open to the call of full-time missions, if God so chooses. This is where I learned and became challenged for missions when I was about 12, and it was because of Buddy. Now, I'm not in the field, but I do stand up here every fourth Sunday of the month, and I represent the missions committee, and we do help and support missionaries around the world. So with that, these boys and girls, 12 and under, recognize Buddy. The teenagers to young adults have what's called Speed the Light. So what did these young kids do? They help provide, oh, let's say school supplies, devotionals, different things that help our missionaries disciple and evangelize out in the field that they are currently working in. That's what our 12 year and under do. But we as adults, we're still kids at heart, right? So we have a fun challenge against the kids, except this week, our challenge is those who have turkey on Thanksgiving, everybody in the green bag, those who have ham, beef, chicken, pork, maybe lamb, 
you get to go in, or even Chinese food. I know some people go for Chinese on Thanksgiving. You go into the blue bag. So let's get started, kids. Turkey in the green, everything else in the blue. State football team over that handoff line. Hey, they're just yeah, they're not doing good this year. I'm a state fan, so I, I'm just I'm I'm openly admitting I'm not delusional about poor performance. Hey, and for those Michigan fans, I don't think you guys are taking the national title, so don't don't get your hopes up. So, hey, I'm an opportunist here that says I had the microphone and. No. In all seriousness, if you're a kid. You can go ahead and take off for kids ministry. Thanks for hanging out and worship with us. If you're a student in 6th to 12th grade, we do have epic discipleship, so you can also take off, and we're going to have epic this morning as well. With the rest of you, there's an announcement video. Check it out. Welcome to the busiest season of the year. Here we are. We're getting ready on November 20th to do our Teen Challenge Thanksgiving dinner service. It is going to be a great time. We already have the main meal and the issues taken care of. All we want you to do is stay for dinner after service, one and all, and bring a dessert if you could, please. That would be great. We're going to have a great sit-down meal, going to share the goodness of God, and you're going to enjoy coming. So please prepare November the 20th. Sunrise Church is having a turkey trot. <laughs> Please buy a ticket for $10. All the proceedings will go to the Project Christmas Joy. You will get, if you win, you will get a 20 pound turkey with fixings and a roaster. Thank you for helping us. That's a Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. That's right. That's right. How the boy climbed. So, Saturday, December 3rd. Is this annoying you? Because it's already distracting me. But, Saturday, December 3rd. All serious note. Saturday, December 3rd, we are actually going to be at Kroger and Howell. We're also going to be at Jonah's ringing bells for Salvation Army. If you're available, we still have some slots in the evening. Saturday, December 3rd, you can make a bunch of noise, ring some bells, tell, give people a chance to donate, help people out in this time of need. So if you're interested, have some availability, please sign up at the Connection Hub. Again, that's Saturday, December 3rd. Be able to help for even an hour that'd be fantastic please stop by the hub sign up today continuing the theme for christmas which how are we talking about christmas i don't even know how we're that close so now you just also got over that shell shock of realizing yeah we're talking about christmas already it's just a few weeks away we have on december 10th so december 3rd we're ringing bells now next week in december 10th we're going to be continuing the Christmas of generosity with the Christmas distribution. We partner with Salvation Army for this as well. 
and we're one of the hubs for distributing gifts. It's an amazing time. So many of you have come out over the years to help and you know how great it is. Some of you have no idea what it is at all. But basically, with a quick summary is, in the morning, people drop off gifts. We'll pack out the sanctuary here. Then we'll have lunch in the afternoon. We have teams distribute them. If you wanna be on the traffic team, AKA the best team, you're probably a teenager. We're gonna be out there throwing snowballs, but we're also direct to traffic. So anybody who's a teen, adult, there is kind of a basic age range. So if it's real young kid, come talk to us. We'll see if there's something that can happen. But this is just a great opportunity as a family to come out Give some Christmas joy, share the love of Jesus. So if you're available for morning, afternoon, whole day, anything like that, please stop out at the hub, sign up today, because we're just a few weeks away, and come out and not only have an amazing time, have a ton of fun, but it's a great way just to share Jesus' love through gifts and generosity here at Sunrise. questions like this all the time. I know I do. And you're like, oh, you've asked this before. Somebody else can answer. What do you like to do? What are you confident about doing? You just have no trouble with it. Eating. You know, Juan says, I can eat like the best of them. Brandon. Talk to people on the internet. Okay. Fishing. You, you throw that line in. How many of you ever met the stones? I call them the, you know, the, the fishing god and goddess. I mean, I'm kidding. Because they, they would say, well, I'm not a but how many of you know that you, she can drop a, a you know, I, I, I tease Bill, but I think Karen's better than he is. I think Karen could drop her bait into a, a puddle in a parking lot and come out with a bass or something. You go, how does this happen? So, so fishing. So, so Paul says, yeah, excellent. What else? What do you just have confidence? You know you can do. Gardening. Excellent. Wonderful. Some people have black thumbs. You have a green thumb. That's a good thing. Maybe one or two more. Yeah, Chris. I can't read it from here. My glasses aren't there. Okay, jujitsu. Oh, he can bend you into pretzels and, and have fun. Good deal. Now, when you do these things, I have met fishermen and fisherwomen, or whatever you say that, that pray. How many of you have ever prayed before you fish or prayed before you hunt? I mean, it's coming up, right? Tuesday. How many of you will be out someplace? outside with a firearm on Tuesday, on Tuesday. Okay, you're hoping to get something. You ever pray about that? Now, are you really expecting God to materialize, you know, the Star Trek transport the deer right in front of you? Probably not. I mean, I suppose he could, but, you know, I've never seen that. So how many of you are just hoping that, that, that you're asking God that your attention is good and your focus is good and your aim is good, right? And that something might wander across your path. Okay. The reason I mention is there are things that you and I don't really think to pray about very often because we know how to do them. How many of you laid in bed this morning and said, Oh Lord, I'm not really sure how to get the cereal in my bowl. And I don't remember where I left the milk. Could you please help me with this so that I can have my cinnamon toast crunch before I go to church? I have no takers, right? I mean, if you decided to have breakfast or a cup of coffee or nothing this morning, you know how to do this. You got up, you did this, it wasn't even something you thought about. There's no sense of dependency. What do you find yourself praying about, though? When do you go to God in prayer? When something breaks down, when you're in need, what'd you say? Constantly. Okay, but we already pretty much established by joke that you're not praying about cinnamon toast crunch. So it's probably not that you might be thanking him for it, and that's good. It's a, a, a proof, you know, statement. But what do you tend, what are the things you tend to pray for, Michelle? When you're in trouble, and there's an and in that statement. Ah, so you pray when you have no solution. When there's nothing that you can do about it, you tend to pray. Now, we've been talking about, I've been talking about, you've been enduring, listening, cheering me on, whatever. Talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As we said, there are things, there are gifts that he gives that do tend to mirror some human talents. A gift of administration. That can mirror a human talent. Have you ever met a human administrator that probably doesn't know how to spell the Holy Spirit? Have you ever seen one of those? You might work with one, work for one, and they could be as, as coarse and as you know, uncivilized and as far from God as you can imagine, but they can run a tight business, they can run a tight unit, they can make it happen, they know what they're doing. 
all right, there can be balances. How many of you know that God's gifts are always used for the profit and benefit and spiritual blessing of all? When you're using a human talent, you might use it for your own profit, for your own ability to, to move your own family, your own company forward. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but that doesn't make it a spiritual gift. You can tell when somebody is operating in the spiritual gift. And spiritual gifts are not things you have on your own. Now, I remember this as a joke. I take it as a joke, and if anybody thinks I'm being serious for five seconds, you really don't know me very well. How many of you have ever met, and somebody's going to get offended when I say this, don't get bent, okay, listen all the way through. How many of you have ever heard about schools of prophecy or schools of healing or schools where you could go and learn things? How many of you know there's nothing wrong with that? To look at the scriptural foundations of how a gift works, to understand. But how many of you know you can't really practice healing someone? Right? I'm looking at Amy. You're, you're a prayer leader, right? You, you can't. You can pray. There's practice in the idea of praying. You know, asking God to intercede through me, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, it's like, you know, do I do it this way? Do I do it this way? How do I do it? You know, I mean, there's no method that you can learn. The joke comes in is, you know, I, I have, I've seen people try to encourage people to speak in tongues in some very strange ways. So let's see if we can all do it together. You ready? Say after me. I bought a Honda. I bought a Honda. I should have bought a Kawasaki. But I bought a Honda. Now say that fast. You're there! You know how to do it. How many of you know that? That's not a human skill. Right? Speaking in tongues is something the Holy Spirit gives us. He makes it possible. It's not learning a series of sounds so that we can jabber our jaws and make that happen. If we could learn how to do it ourselves... If we could bring in our own strength, our own intelligence, our own capability, if we could bring the Holy Spirit, grab him and force him into our heart and say, okay, all the gifts are now awake, we would. Well, some of us would. How many of you know some human beings are always a little uncomfortable with the gifts of the Spirit anyway, and even if they could grab them and force them in themselves, they wouldn't bother? But it would be something we could do. But instead, we have to actually stop because we can't do it on our own. And we have to ask God. We have to be dependent on God. And I think, folks, sometimes we, we make a lot of talk about how that's easy to do. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes what happens is we pray and the answer does not come and we're, we're left to wonder why. And we can get angry and we can get confused. Now I can specifically, and I am specifically intending to bring this topic up because I have met many people, many of you in here, have said, you know, I've prayed about the baptism of the Holy Spirit before it hasn't happened. I've prayed again and it hasn't happened. I've prayed again and it hasn't happened. And so, you know, I'm beginning to wonder whether it's real or maybe God's just not going to give it to me or, you know, there's some flaw, the fault flaw in me that stands in the way. There must be because I'm not getting what I think I should be getting. It's not happening. Even if you step outside of the idea of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, though, how many of you have ever prayed, worked, labored for something and it didn't work the way you hoped? Tuesday. You know, I know there are those that might be excited about the people that were elected. Great, no problem. I'm not talking about the people. Here I'm mainly talking about the principle. I think that this congregation, for the most part, if you're not on that page, well, I'm happy to talk to you later. I'm not trying to d dishonor you in any way. But the idea of abortion, I think, is pretty key in our minds and hearts that that was a problem. And an awful lot of people have been working on that for the better part of 50 years. Giving, praying, taking risks. It's not my main subject matter today. It's not the point. I'm just saying, how many of you, they might have found Tuesday to be a real cold shower? Because the people of Michigan decided that they didn't believe the things that you and I believe, and they wanted something entirely different. Now, have you ever looked at God and said, okay, I don't get it. How is this possible, God? 
I mean, you know, your people prayed. We know that you can't be into murdering babies. We're pretty much sure. We live in the Old Testament and the New. That's not in there. This murdering baby thing is not something that fits your character. And we as your people, we, we prayed and we spent time and we invested money and effort. And, and still, Tuesday happened anyway. God, what's the point? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I bet you some of you could raise your hand and say, yeah, that's kind of how I felt Wednesday morning. Why is it that that much energy was put into something that we're sure is God's will? Well, I could come up with lots of answers. They may be good, they may not. Have you ever heard of something called free will? How many of you know that your prayers don't usually force somebody's free will to do what it doesn't want to do? You ever pray that somebody fall in love with you? <laughs> good luck with that. Even the Disney genie knows he can't do that. I'm just saying, you know, there, are, there are things that, that are operating on free will, and people express free will on Tuesday. They might have expressed it deceived. That's likely. They might have expressed it in reaction to what they saw as a threat, but they expressed it. It's a reason. Maybe people that should have gone to vote didn't bother to because they figured everything was set and good and ready and there was no issue, so they managed to run out and get dinner or do something else. Maybe. My question is, there's a lot of things we can pray for, whether they're deeply spiritual, whether they're the events that are going on around us, and we want to see them happen. We're sure that they must be so, and yet they seem not to. And I'm going to take you today to the book of Romans. We've been studying Romans on uh, Wednesday nights. If you've never done Romans, I encourage you to do that. I don't try to do a lot of commercials, and I know that Wednesday night is a hard time period for many. You're late getting home from work. You're trying to put food in your face, and the last thing you want to do is try to wrestle everybody into the car and show up on a Wednesday night. I get that. And if that's not your service, no sweat. But one of the things that we do on a Wednesday night, in the adult group anyway, that we don't have the time to do here, is that we've gone over the entire scripture, verse by verse, all of it. Over the time I've been here, we're actually back around and doing it again. Doing it in a slightly different order. So you have the opportunity to dig into books, dig into chapters with us and find out. And there's a little bit more discussion rather than straight lecture. And there's some questions that happen. So I encourage it. We're actually just finished. We're starting Romans 2 there. But today I want you to look at Romans chapter 4. I'm going to catch the very end of the 16th verse and following. Romans 4, 16b. But also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, and by the way, that who refers back to Abraham, who Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, we know the story. I know you know the story. I can preach it out of the Old Testament, but I love the way that Paul puts it here in Romans. Imagine for a second being Abraham. You're a rich guy if you count animals. Right? He wasn't Scrooge McDuck counting gold pieces on his desk. He had money on the hoof. Had a lot of it. At one point, he was able to put an army together of 318 guys and go attack a coalition of kings, so he, he had a staff. He did all right there in the wilderness, but imagine when he started. When he started, does anybody remember how old was Abe when the story starts in Genesis? 75. Now, somebody's going to say, well, wait a second, they lived a lot longer back then. Well, yes, there was a line of people that's listed in Scripture that did live a very long time, but even that was starting to fade, and Abraham die at about what 170 175 that's still way older than you and i but how many of you realize he was kind of on the low end of middle aged anyway 
no matter how you cut it, no matter what capacity this could have existed, he was 75. He was not a young man. Now, today, 75, we might think, well, I'm definitely in the somewhat older category. Then, maybe light middle age. His wife was 65. Again, I don't know all of the human conditions there either, but most people back then did not exceed a century. How many of you figure that by 65, you're probably on the extreme outside edge of having a baby? And I'm probably being real, you know, polite with that. I have heard cases with medical care and, and careful monitoring and all kinds of issues. There are women in their mid-50s who are giving birth. Now, you might think, uh oh, I don't want to do that. I, my wife would have said, no way, no, not happening. But how many of you realize that, that that's only today in the modern world, with all of the abilities that, that they can bring to it, they can make that remotely safe, and even that is considered the highest of high risk pregnancies to do. So if you want to say that maybe they could have gone longer back then, Sarah still starts the story at 65. And God said two things. Move to this land called Canaan, and I'm going to give you over where you set your foot. Now, how many of you, are, you here have ever moved? Raise your hand if you've moved. You've ever shifted homes, apartments. Now, I'll go farther. How many of you shifted towns, states? Huh? Some of you have countries. I know, I know Bob's working back there, and he and Kathy lived in Europe for a while when he worked, for, and, and you have too. So, so you have lots. How many, how many of you know you can do it? It's not convenient, it's not easy, and it sure helps if you got some money to, to make it easy to hire the right assistants. But at the same time, moving from location A to location B is not impossible. And most of us have done it. And if you really strongly felt in your heart, and since Wednesday morning, I have definitely dealt with people who feel very much like that. The safety lies in some other place. Okay? Moving isn't the hard thing that God asked Abram to do. Yes, I understand it was potentially losing his friends, losing the city that he was familiar with, the amenities that it had. And yes, on foot, Canaan is a fair distance from Ur. But how many of you know you could drive between Canaan and Ur? I know there were no cars back then. I remember my history. But how many of you know you could drive it within a day very easily? Not that far. The moving wasn't the bigger challenge. The challenge was is that God looks at Abe and says, I am going to make you... The father of many nations. Now, I don't know how good Abraham's math capacity was, but I'm pretty sure he could have gone, okay, how many kids do I have right now? Zero. Okay, that, that's a little bit challenging. I'm 75. My wife's probably at the outside edge of being able to have a child. And you're saying that she and I, he didn't just say him and someone, he said you and Sarah. That's pretty specific. Are you, you, you're going to bring nations out. Um, have you ever laughed at something somebody has told you? Spiritual or otherwise, somebody tells you something, you know, it's been totally ridiculous. And you're just like, yeah, right, that's going to happen, sure. Right? I mean, now Sarah does that at one point, and yes, she gets some judgment for it. I understand. How many of you realize that that would have been a pretty normal human response for Abe? I'm going to be what? Who am I going to be adopting? How long have I been married? How long has she and I tried? It's not happening. But he says, okay, I'll move, and I believe. Now, you might think, well, but Abraham had a long relationship with God. We don't know that. In fact, the way you actually look at the story in Genesis, God shows up one day. This is a pagan town, right? We have no idea. The main worship was of the moon. And it was very possible that Abe was a good moon worshiper before we don't know. We literally know nothing. And God starts talking, and we're not exactly sure how. Was it in a dream? Was it in the, the daytime looking at the sheep? I don't know. But somehow God starts talking to him, and he starts listening. But it's not a multi-year relationship where he's deeply dug into the word, surrounded by other disciples of God who love and can encourage him. He's alone. And God says, I'm going to make you a father. And it's important to get that promise and, and understand that it's a specific promise. Abe ups, moves his family, shows up in Canaan. And year one goes by, no babies. 
year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, year seven. I know, you can count too. They get all the way up to year 12 or 13. And finally, Sarah, who at this point is how old? 70, 77 or 78, depending on how you cut it. Abram was 87 or 88. She says, take my servant Hagar. Nothing's happening here, honey. Not happening. She's a lot younger. Let's see if you still work. Sorry, not turn me around. How many of you know historically there have been old men who have fathered children? I'm not always sure why and what's going on there and why the woman didn't run screaming, but whatever. It's, it's been known to happen. And so Abram takes the challenge. And, and goes in, he fathers a child with Hagar. So it, it, the, the issue currently was not Abe's ability to produce seed. And Hagar has a child. And, you know, okay, and God goes, not that one. Seriously? I mean, it worked. I'm 87, 80 years old, it worked. You Didn't we come up with a solution? No. And Abraham goes, okay, I believe. You're going to create a child from Sarah and me. And another year, and another year, and another year, and another year. And pretty soon, talk about God testing the destruction. Maybe you believe that at the age of 75. How many of you think by the age of 100, this ship has long sailed? And I love the words here in, in you know, chapter 4 of Romans. When he says he doesn't consider his body, knowing that it's dead. He's like, no, nah, this is not going to work. There's no, it's been 12 years since, you know, Ishmael. There's no way this is going to work. And, you know, Sarah, she was done 12 years ago. I mean, there's, there's no way this is going to happen. You've just raised the odds to insanity. So when you look at Romans chapter 4, where it says, against hope he had hope. Hoping against hope. It made Zero sense, humanly speaking. Zero sense. Hundred-year-old men do not father children with 90-year-old wives. It does not happen. And even back then, it was frankly impossible. But God promised. And somehow, despite all the impossibility, despite the fact that Abraham is not a dumb man, he understands how life works. How many of you realize that on the farm, your understanding of biology is Pretty close, right? You're dealing with animals all the time. You know how it works. You know when they're no longer able to have another one. You understand how this works. You're not mystified. In our world, who knows? Maybe we're mystified. We're so separated from life. But back then, you were on the farm with the critters. You knew how it worked. And yet, he still believed. Now, imagine, we see that in Romans in a little bit. There's a point, and there's a point, and there's a point. Imagine it for 25 years. Do you think you're pregnant? Do you think you're pregnant? This time? Stay away, eh? Don't even come near me again. <laughs> right? 25 years. Why did God wait that long? I don't have an answer for you. I don't know. We can say things like he was testing his faith. How many of you realize that the average human being, the faith would have given up a long time before that? Maybe that's God's plan. I don't know. Maybe God is forging something in Abraham. It's just kind of like boot camp, right? You bring a bunch of people in, they might be tough. You're going to make them tougher, right? Break them down, build them up again. Maybe that's God's version of spiritual boot camp. But Abraham still believes. Now remember, he believed in a specific promise. He believed in the promise given by God's character. Now, I want to throw something at you, and it might, I don't know, maybe it'll shock you, and you go, oh, I do that, big deal. How many of you know that God, I mean, this might bend you a little bit, how many of you know God made no specific promises of any sort about America? Not one. Oh, but, Jeff, but Pastor Jeff, there's, there's eagles in the Bible. How many of you know eagles have been used by lots of nations that may have nothing to do with us? Does God know that we're here? Yes. Does God care about his believing people that live here? Yes. Does God have a point and a purpose and, and a direction that America could be used at in the world? Yes. I'm not denying any of that. Do I think that the Bible was written specifically for America? No. And beyond America, does God say anything ever about Michigan? 
No. Now, we can say God didn't like abortion, and I totally agree with that. He does not. That is not cool. I can promise you that. How do I know? There were some religions back then where they put babies on the glowing hands of statues. They were heated from the inside by fire, and they burned their children. Talk about an abortion. God had serious problems with that religion. Serious problems. And told them zero tolerance, zero play. Do not go there. Destroy it when it comes. Is God against abortion? Absolutely. Did God make a promise to us about abortion? Not me and him. No. Should we still pray? Yes. Is it a worthy cause? Yes. Is it worthy to give to and work for? Yes. I totally agree with that. Sign me up. I'm there. I'm just telling you, even though it is a good thing to do, and we believe that it is in the character of God, God made no specific promises about Tuesday, November 8th, 2022. None. Did God make promises to you about other things? Yeah. Go and tarry, and you will receive power. And you shall become my witnesses. Well, wait a second, Pastor. That wasn't to me. That was to the, the disciples. Well, it was to the disciples and at least another 120 that were with him. Well, 108, if I did my math right with the other. 120 people. And how many of you know that that continued process went on and on and on and on? So as I mentioned last week, 20 years later, when they get to Ephesus, and Paul begins to talk to them and said, Hey, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit? What's the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized in Jesus' name? No, we have John's baptism. What does Paul say? Well, we're going to baptize you in Jesus' name. Okay. What happens to them? They get filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I understand that process. See, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I was too dumb to know better. What do I mean? And this is not particularly picking on the denomination I'm mentioning. There are wonderful, godly, spirit-driven churches in the denomination that I'm going to mention, but not mine. The church I grew up in was a social club. It was the Methodist church in the city of Waterford. I didn't even really barely know who Jesus was, and I was there almost every Sunday since I was born. So I could have told you about Marxism in Central America, a big topic back then in the 70s, but Jesus, he's a picture on a wall. There's nothing there. Well, my mom, how dare she, got saved. And she hijacked me at the age of 12, and she sent me to Lost Valley Church Camp, which she knew nothing about, except that it was Pentecostal, and maybe it would do me good. And so I went. Now, I know nothing about Jesus, and on night two, on Tuesday, the evangelist preaches in a way that grabs my attention. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll buy into that. And I say a prayer, and I really do believe that something changed. It's like, oh, that's cool. And then two nights later, on a Thursday, he starts talking about this baptism of the Holy Spirit thing. How many of you know that just like the people in Ephesus, I know nothing about the Holy Spirit on Thursday? I know nothing. I don't have any denominational overlay here. I don't have any, it's not for today, it's of the devil. And that went away with the completion of the scriptures. I don't know any of that. I've never heard of any of that. I, I mean, really, if you really would have asked at 12, I might have been able to say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but didn't really know what that meant. And then somebody else says, hey, this is an experience that you can walk in. And I go, okay. And I pray. And it happens. How many of you know this has nothing to do with the great moral character of the 12-year-old that's at the altar? Trust me, no. It has nothing to do with the spiritual accomplishments, with the deep scriptural wisdom. No. I said I was lucky that I didn't have all the immunization that our culture gives us so often. But a lot of us do. A lot of us have, let's face it, of, how many of you have ever met a weird Pentecostal? Come on, raise a hand, you, even if it's you, who knows, right? you met a weird one. Yeah, you know, you met somebody, I mean, I remember a Bible college professor said that he, this friend of his used to walk up to people in Springfield, Missouri, and shout at them in tongues, and then say, you want to be able to do that? 
this is not a good witnessing approach, you know? I mean, and no, this is just weird. And there are people who can occasionally be weird, and you go, I don't want to be weird. How many of you ever said, I don't want to talk like that or do that stuff because I'll be embarrassed? I mean, I, yeah, something about, and I'm talking to a Pentecostal pastor, and you were there, right? I want to do that. I'm not sure. Or maybe you heard this, or you heard that, or you're kind of, again, we are so used to being able to do things and control things in our lives that the idea of turning something over to God and letting him control it is frankly terrifying to some people. I love the Jesus thing. I really like hell as a future real estate, I, I, I like hell less as a future real estate option than heaven. But I don't know about God taking over like my mouth. I like to control this thing. How many of you think you might speak better on occasion if God had control your mouth? It just is what it is, right? Okay. So notice here with Abe, he has a promise. And you have a promise. Now there may be other things that you say, you know, I know that God said, I believe utterly that God said he's going to save my kids. I believe utterly that he's going to save my household. I'm going back to that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I believe that. Great. And you've prayed and you've prayed and they're still sinners. And you've prayed and you've prayed and the marriage still isn't working. And you've prayed and you've prayed and your job still stinks. And you've prayed and you've prayed and your, your uh, bank account doesn't make any sense. And you've prayed and you've prayed and your body still doesn't feel any better. If you have got a promise for God, you better hold on. At the end here, it says literally that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. That means God looked at him. This is what I know Jesus Christ in all eternity, and that applies to him. But in this case, God is saying, I am looking at Abe, who believes in me to the degree that at a hundred years old, he's still believing that a baby is possible from his 90-year-old wife. There is something fundamentally different about this guy. And if you look at the story, Abe's got lots of problems. Abe is not a major moral paragon. He lies about things. He has trouble. He does things that aren't right. You look at the story for yourself. But Abe believed. And if you're here this morning, you say, but I've been praying about this stuff. Whether, again, whether you, you were worried about the election, whatever it was, I've been praying about this stuff. I don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've been praying about stuff. I haven't seen the solution. Do not quit. Do not quit. God has given you a promise. Tarry, and ye shall receive power, and ye shall be my witnesses. It may not have your name on it. It may not say Jeff, or Bree, or Kevin, on the scripture. But how many of you know he was talking over the disciples' heads to everybody who would follow? And for the next minimum 20 years in scripture, that continued to pour on. And there's no place that ever says it stopped. I love to have a worship team come up. I love our prayer folks, too. Now, last week, we had to bring an end to things. I understand that, although a lot of people stayed a fairly long time. And again, I know you may have to work. You may have family arrangements. I'm, I'm not trying to get in your face and make you do what you don't want to do. And I do understand that you do not have to pray at this altar. Like I said last week, there's not something specially holy about this piece of real estate, these carpet squares, that make your prayers connect. Just come join. No. I met somebody who got the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the bathtub. They weren't in church at the time. It's a good thing. But how many of you know that God gave a promise to you? He has gifts that he wants to unpack. He has a life that he wants you to be fully thankful for. Don't quit just because you don't see it. A guy named Abe waited 25 years. And it was when it was freaking impossible. Hi, I'm Isaac. The child showed up. Would you bow your heads with me? Again, I realize that maybe even people on our prayer team have things that they would like prayer for. Great, we'll do that. But I'd love to have our prayer team come. Just you know, come up to the altar. If you usually do this in the middle of service, I'd like to have you come up now. How many of you by raise a hand real quick, not looking at anybody else, can 
say, you know, I prayed for some things, Pastor, for a long time. I haven't seen them. Wow, someone's had our hand up already. I haven't seen them. I haven't seen that thing change. Is there anybody here that can say, you know, Pastor, I've been thinking about this baptism of the Holy Spirit thing. And maybe I have been praying about it for a while, and I've just never seen it happen. It's never taken place for me. And I don't know why, but I can lift a hand and just say, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there. I, there's a promise that just hasn't unfolded in me yet. Is that you? No, we're not going to come and grab you and haul you up here. That's up to you. This is the moment, I think, where we need to say, God, I'm holding on to this. I will not let go. Do it up here at the altar today. I'd love it. That'd be great. I go out of this church. Cha-ching. You've done the thing that I hoped for. Man, life could not be better. But if it doesn't happen up here today, I will not let go. I am going to believe that this issue that I lay at your feet will be solved and you will let me know what needs to happen. Would you come? Make a place where you are. Find a place up here. Ask for the Holy Spirit. Ask for healing. Ask for those things that are on your heart. But dig in and don't quit. Come on. Don't wait. My breath of life.
happening up here. You know, I asked earlier, I said, who's got something they've been praying for for a while? And I admittedly, I gave you lots of outs, didn't I? You can stay right where you are. You don't have to come up here. That's true. You don't. No tricks going on. But I found something to be interesting. How many of you know that, that a true fan for a team is always finding hope? I mean, if you're the Lions fan, you have to say, what was next year? Or, or, or maybe the Spartans these days. They're maybe next year, right? I and mean, we start from game one. But it's funny how we're always able to talk about the things that we are find important. If we find it important and worthy of faith, we'll talk about it. If it's, if it's a company, if it's a business, if it's a government, if it's whatever it is, you, people talk about it all the time. And yet some of us are walking around this church, walking around our life, and we have hopes, we have things we've been praying for for a long time, and we're not telling anybody. I think you need to change that. I think you need to lean into the wind. Now, I can imagine how silly it would be to be Abraham, right? Someday, I'm going to be a father of many nations. Probably going what a foolish old man. But he laughed in the end because God made that possible and he didn't give up. Amen? He made that possible. And I think that sometimes we have to stop worrying about being embarrassed. If you're praying about something, you should be hanging out with other believers and you should be quick to tell them. I am praying that. I am praying that my kids get saved. I am praying that this problem change. I am praying that I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I am praying that my gifts be able to be used. Let them know. Ask them to pray for you. Drive them crazy if you have to. But make sure other people are there praying for you too. Sitting there quietly and saying, well, I'm a little embarrassed. Will never help get you where you need to go. Not ever. Now, if you're here, and I've heard some people say, you know, I want to use my gifts. I'm not sure what they are. Yeah, I've got a gifts test I can give you. You can come and ask me for it. I can hand it to you. You can take care of it. It'll show you probabilities at best. But how many of you know that there's nothing wrong with finding people that have the gifts you hope you have? 
and asking if you can hang around them for a while. Amen? If you're trying to be a fisherman, that might be a good idea to find one that knows what they're doing. Right? If you want to know, I, I want to know how I can do tongues and interpretation. I want to know if God can move in me in prophecy, in hospitality. Find somebody that's got it. Well, I don't know where to ask. You could ask me. I mean, not that I have one. I'm not saying that. I might be able to point you in the right direction. Amen? Don't give up. Don't shut up. Believe. See what God opens up. Don't back up. Amen? Go for it. I'm done with my statement. You, you go for it. 